Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Friends, uh, welcome for another important discussion uh, from Unit 4th uh, that is changing agrarian structure and rural developmental concern in rural society. And uh, in uh, today's discussion, uh, we are trying to focus upon Unit 16th uh, that is rural cooperative and panchayati raj institution. This discussion will basically highlight the notion of cooperatives and the features of panchayati raj institutions as the issue of developmental concern with regard to the rural society uh, that is going to be important. And I think uh, broadly we will try to speak about uh, the meaning of cooperatives uh, and the co cooperation and the cooperative societies and also what are the basic characteristics of cooperatives, what are the types of cooperatives and also we will try to exemplify the case of operation flood as a case study. And apart from that in the second half of the discussion, uh, our focus will be on the historical backdrop of Panchayati Raj institutions and we will try to cover up uh, the various committees which had been formulated like the Balwant Rai Mehta committee, Ashok Mehta committee and the subcommittees which have been formed and finally we will try to speak about the 73rd constitutional amendment and also the functions of PRI. And uh, in the last phase we are going to be uh, having a critique of 73rd amendment. So I think uh, this is a broader framework in which we will try to uh, discuss upon uh, the two issues. Uh, why we have taken cooperatives and uh, Panchayat Raj institutions because somewhere they are uh, uh, <coughs> speaking about the essence of democracy. Uh, one is more towards the economic democracy and uh, PRI is more towards the political democracy. So I think uh, that is how we have connected the two issues together. Although uh, both of them are related to the rural development in terms of the transition in the rural society. Uh, so that way I think uh, uh, whole justification is there for uh, putting them together. And uh, quickly if we try to see, uh, first we are going to speak about the cooperative uh, and the cooperation movement in India. So uh, basically the government of India, independent India, when they started uh, working upon the economic status of the villagers, uh, they have tried to create the cooperative societies uh, which could help for the peasantry as a whole. Uh, Air Desai, when st while stressing the importance of cooperative uh, societies in independent India argues for encouragement of cooperative sectors in the rural society. So that is how we try to see the importance of uh, cooperative societies. The history of cooperative development indicates that the government has made all efforts for the establishment of the cooperative societies. It is also a fact that our national leaders like uh, Gandhiji and Nehruji made all efforts for the promotion of cooperative society. However, the present day working of cooperative societies is uh, seen as quite dismissal and many of them have started uh, dis uh, dysfunctional. So leaving aside the states of Gujarat and Maharashtra, I think uh, uh, in the rest of the places we do not find a meaningful cooperative society. But uh, in spite of going into those details, let us try to understand that how we can understand the cooperatives. So we have to see that uh, uh, we try to see it uh, as a form of uh, functioning. Uh, of a specific form of uh, uh, economy uh, like uh, B.S. Babiskar has argued that uh, power conflict uh, sometimes has emerged in the cooperative societies and that is why uh, they have stopped functioning. Uh, similarly, we try to see uh, that uh, the contribution of Daniel Thorner is also going to be significant uh, who try to see village cooperatives uh, which have been run by the richer sections of the society. So I think uh, we have all the odds of cooperative societies uh, which has led to the downfall. But uh, as I said that uh, uh, before going into the critique of uh, the cooperatives, uh, we have to understand uh, that what is uh, the meaning of cooperation and the cooperative societies first. So I think uh, the cooperatives definitely has a bearing from the word cooperation uh, which means to work together. And however, the meaning of corporate society is quite technical and in the context of uh, uh, village corporations in India, uh, we try to see what uh, M. T. Herrick uh, in the context of peasantry has described the co cooperative society. He writes that cooperation is the act of poor persons voluntarily 
unite for utilizing reciprocally their own forces, resources or both under their mutual management to their common profit or loss. So, I think this is how uh, he is trying to say and thus Herrick brings out the few elements uh, which are essential for making uh, something to be a cooperative society. First is that it is an organization of poor that is first important thing. Second is it is a voluntary nature and third is it is a sharing common resources. So, I think uh, these are the important aspects or ingredients one can say of the cooperative society and uh, we try to see that the basic idea of cooperative society exclude the role of big peasants. It is supposed to be the union of small and the marginal peasants and uh, on that fashion we try to see that the cooperative planning committee uh, was constituted in 1946 and they have defined the cooperatives in the context of uh, Indian peasantry and they observed that cooperation is a form of organization in which person voluntarily associate together on the basis of equality for the promotion of their common interest. So, this is how we try to see that uh, the cooperative planning committee had tried to draft the meaning of cooperations uh, when the understanding of cooperative movement was to be generated. So, the committee has elaborated the meaning of cooperatives and they, they say that the objective of the cooperative society is to promote the economic interest of the common peasants. The association is basically meant for equality. The function of cooperative society cannot be fulfilled by the individual, it has to be seen collective and the idea is that what individual cannot do because of the limitation uh, of his own uh, can be done in a collective way. So, this is how we try to see that uh, uh, the idea of cooperative uh, movements came into prominence. Uh, although we can have another meaning of cooperatives uh, which can be seen in terms of consumers, uh, basically in terms of uh, the causes by war, flood, drought and other adverse situations. Then in the 1940s the idea of social service started emerging uh, which has some connotation with the cooperatives and recently we try to see the cooperatives has undergone a revolutionary change and the cooperatives today are formed uh, for the attainment of development. So, we try to see that cooperatives are uh, constituted to provide loans uh, for the agricultural inputs uh, and purchase of implements, uh, digging of the wells or maybe a certain other aspect of agriculture. So, that is how we try to see that uh, now cooperatives are being seen as having a diversified purpose. So, uh, further if you try to enhance the understanding of cooperatives, let us try to see what are the characteristics of cooperatives. So, uh, we, uh, we had seen uh, shown and uh, reflected that uh, during the colonial period, it was a real, uh, realization that peasantry was the most exploited group of the people. And so, the industrial policy that the colonial regime had adopted was going to be uh, deadly for the small artisans and the workers uh, working in the cotton industries. And so, Mahatma Gandhi has realized that if the cultivators were not rescued from the onslaught of the industrial development, the village would be ruined and the plow therefore, has always been the hope and glory of the people. So, it was emphasized that the cultivators has to be financially assisted to increase their farm product and thus made the India self-sufficient. So, the salient feature of cooperatives uh, which we identify today are the product of the policy adopted by post-independent India, especially the Rural Credit Survey Committee in 1951 suggested that cooperatives should provide coverage to the rural poor uh, who have no chance against the vested interest of the landlord, money lenders, uh, trader and the other affluent class. So, the committee therefore, recommended that the state government should participate in the share capital of the cooperatives and also provide the managerial support and the subsidies. So, the committee has recommended uh, that the Reserve Bank of India uh, should support the movement by way of reimbursement of loans uh, extended by the cooperative society. So, the committee suggested a three tier structure of large scale credit cooperatives at the base, the district cooperative banks as the central financial agencies and at the apex uh, cooperative banks at the state level supported by agriculture divisions of the Reserve Bank of India. So, on the basis of the uh, provisions of cooperative societies, uh, we can see that what are the important aspect. First thing of course, as we said is organization of the poor that is going to be an important issue. Uh, second thing which we have to see is uh, membership is voluntary, it is not by force, 
Uh, third is the absence of exploitation. A cooperative society inherently denies the exploitation of its members and consumers. And the fourth is the uh, role of a bank. So, the cooperative society cannot be left to itself, rather the government uh, has to be welfare oriented uh, in order to support uh, uh, the uh, aspect of uh, the cooperatives. So, uh, it is to be said that RBI uh, being the apex bank has made provisions for working of the cooperative banks. And finally, we have the subsidies which are seen as uh, the sort of uh, 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 provision whereby we try to have a certain amount of relaxation with regard to certain items and cooperative societies which are to be seen as autonomous with regard to uh, providing certain subsidies uh, in terms of uh, the payment to, to the peasantry. Uh, so, that is how we try to see uh, these are the provisions uh, which has been made for making cooperative to be effective. Now, let us quickly try to see what are the different types of cooperative societies. So, on the basis of functioning, the cooperatives may be uh, divided into three types. The first is the credit societies, uh, second is the consumer societies and the third is the producer society. So, these are the three basic type uh, which can be further divided into several types uh, like uh, we can say that uh, the subdivision can be on the basis of cotton grower society, it can be on the basis of sugar cane society, it can be on the basis of wheat producer society and so on. So, in the similar way there are subtypes of consumer cooperatives and produ uh, producer cooperatives. So, now let us try to see uh, each one of them uh, distinctively like we try to speak about the credit cooperative societies. The credit societies are voluntarily and mutually aid associations. The major function of this type of society is to provide credit on personal security or on the basis of nominal security to its members who are either cultivators, workmen or lower middle class people. They are of two types, you unlimited liability and of the liability. So, I think uh, this is the structure, uh, this is the understanding of the uh, credit cooperative society. The second is the consumer society. The membership of this society consists of agricultural work and the middle class people who organize a consumer store. The member of the society earn their independent living. They are now not supposed to depend on the consumer society. The society only help them in the better utilization of their income and thus lowering their cost of living, correct treatment, quality goods and reasonable prices are the chief aim of the consumer society. The third form of society is the producer society. A producer society is organized for the production of goods and services based on the common ownership and management by a group of workers to eliminate the employer employer relationship. Because uh, when we try to speak about the cooperatives, the notion of uh, the employer and the employee is missing. So, in our country, these are the three types of cooperatives. Uh, which we try to see which sometimes uh, uh, are seen in terms of mixed form also. A single society can be seen as a credit consumer and the production society at the same time. Uh, so, this is how we have uh, the broader classification of the cooperative society. Now, uh, to be more specific, uh, let us try to see that how the history of the cooperative movement in India had started. Uh, we try to see that the experience of the British government with the India's present society uh, was seen in terms of uh, uh, the various occasions, especially during famine, the scarcity, war situations and many adversities. And it may also be found that Indian peasantry always has suffered from the lack of fund required for the development of the farm produce. And the striking factors uh, is that the Zagidars and the Zamindars, they also wanted to exploit uh, the peasants in the name of offering them the loans. So, even they required uh, certain amount of uh, uh, support uh, which was seen as exploitative if uh, they wanted to have uh, these approaches. So, this prompted the British government to establish the credit cooperative societies in the villages. So, the first cooperative credit society act was passed in 1904 to remove the weakness of this act. The new cooperative uh, society act was passed in 1912. So, the movement has now made rapid strides. The government uh, before fostering and supporting it wanted to make sure that if it was developing on the right lines and therefore, they appointed a committee that is the Mac Lagan uh, committee in 1914 which suggested certain improvement in its functioning such as better procedure of audit, emphasis on teaching to members and 
to have the steady progress of the movement. However, in spite of certain warnings by the given committee, the number of societies continue to increase rapidly. So, I think uh, somewhere we try to see that uh, uh, certain reforms have been projected when we have to have the development of the cooperative movement. The cooperative movement uh, got a boost during the war, war period, especially in various uh, post-war plans were drawn up in the country and they all emphasize the increasing role of the cooperative movement. Uh, the second report on the recommendation and planning issued by government of India gave importance to the cooperative movement and as a result the cooperative planning committee was appointed by the government of India in 1945. It was in 1951 that the RBI has appointed a committee with the uh, terms of guidance to survey the all India rural credit societies and the report of the committee was submitted in 1954. And what were the important suggestions and recommendation of this committee? Uh, first was there should be a partnership of the state government in all kind of societies and banks uh, <coughs> like the central bank, state banks, cooperative banks so that uh, it can be more viable. Uh, second was a central committee for cooperative training should be set up. The third was it would be responsibility of the state government to implement these programs. And the fourth was the funding of the cooperative societies of all kinds including the cooperative training center will be from the uh, following resources. Uh, first one is the Reserve Bank of India, second is the National Agricultural Credit Fund, third is the National Agricultural Credit Stabilization Fund, fourth is the State Agricultural Credit uh, Relief and Guarantee Fund and uh, also we have the State Cooperative Development Fund and finally we will have the State Cooperative Bank and Central Cooperative Bank. So I think uh, these are the external agencies. Uh, which should come in support with the cooperatives uh, to make it more effective financially. And then another important aspect is that the credit institution at the primary, secondary and the apex level need to be reorganized at least 51 percent of the share in apex organization and that should be held by the state government. So, I think somewhere the state has to uh, own the major responsibility that is the basic idea. Further. Uh, there shall be a central land mortgage bank in each state uh, at uh, and the primary land mortgage bank should be at the lower level. So, I think uh, this was another salient feature and finally, we try to see that the primary uh, village credit society should be reorganized as to have the membership of about 500 persons and these should be linked up with the marketing societies. So, we try to see that processing function is to be developed substantially and specially for producing the sugar, uh, gaining the cotton, crushing the oil and uh, bailing the jute. So, uh, these are certain uh, recommendations which are been made by the committee and later on it was been accepted by government of India and the collective effort was made uh, to put in the second five year plan. So, I think uh, many initiatives have been taken place uh, in pre-independence and post-independence for making the cooperative movement more effective. Now, let us try to see that what are the various exemplifications of cooperative societies. So, we try to see uh, like we have the milk cooperatives societies developed in Gujarat uh, which is seen as a sort of a white revolution. Uh, we may be talking about it in detail in this coming section. Uh, similarly, we have the sugarcane cooperative societies in Uttar Pradesh and Maharashtra uh, which has brought the massive production and also we try to see that uh, most of them had. Uh, the state and the national uh, association and recognition. Uh, like uh, one we try to see uh, in terms of classification, we can have the agricultural credit and multipurpose society. So, in the beginning uh, when the cooperative movement was started in 1904, uh, there were only the credit societies. During the later years, uh, during the year of depression in 1929-30, it was realized that the main weakness of the movement was absorption or in credit activities to the exclusion of others. So, it was felt that money lenders could not be dispensed with unless all his functions were taken up. Uh, similarly, the credit without linking uh, up in the production and marketing uh, will be dangerous. And thirdly, there was a paucity of trained personnel to manage the various societies in the small village. So, I think uh, keeping these things in mind, uh, it was been strongly recommended. Uh, uh, by various committees including the cooperative planning committee of 1946 that uh, attempt has to be made for reorganizing them. Second is the 
former service societies the national commission on agriculture gave the idea of the formation uh, of the former service societies in 1970s and these societies have been constituted in few states and the idea ultimately was to convert the service societies into the large scale multi purpose uh, society credit societies the agriculture credit uh, societies are to be seen as supplier of uh, the medium credit to the members in the rural areas and that is how we try to see the functioning of it uh, the third is the cooperative marketing and processing societies uh, here the effort was made towards the creation of cooperative marketing and processing societies the marketing societies uh, procure and distribute the food grains and certain other commodities to be distributed through its branches to the consumer so the processing societies have come out successfully in the field of uh, uh, producing sugar cane uh, gaining cotton crushing oil and the jute production and then uh, we have a very significant uh, uh, cooperative that is a large scale agricultural multi purpose societies uh, which is abbreviated as lamps l a m p s uh, so in the 1970 it was been realized that the fruit of the economic development was not reaching to the poorest and the backward strata of the society so the small and the marginal farmers who form the bulk of rural households were not getting their due so the concept of farmer service society was conceived uh, to make the things more effective a form of such society was introduced among the tribals and here uh, uh, we let us discuss the lamps working among the tribals in the tribal sub plan projects now what are the provisions uh, which are part and parcel of uh, the uh, lamps as i said that uh, it's a uh, all capital l a m p s uh, which is was a scheme so there are specific types of cooperatives uh, first of course is to provide trade facilities to the people of the tribal areas uh, second is to provide loaning facilities to the tribal in order to get them rid of the exploitation by the traders third is to bridge the gap in development between the tribal and the non tribal segments and also to eradicate the poverty among the tribals fourth is to help the agriculturalist in the procurement and marketing of the minor forest produce agriculture commodities and also uh, to maintain the ecosystem alongside the guidance for the development and the last is uh to work as an agent of the government uh, or the state level cooperative institutions and the local self cooperation for providing seed manure agriculture implements food grains and other consumption articles thus the introduction of lamps therefore is made with the objective to cope up with the particular economy of the tribals so lamps was basically uh, an aspect of the tribal sub plan area and uh, uh, what is required of course is that the tribal should have a uh, self sufficiencies and certain amount of uh, uh, what you can say uh, exploitation of the tribals cannot be maintained cannot happen uh, that is the basic idea of the slam in terms of a, a cooperative uh, society so we try to see that uh, that was another such initiative then we have the milk supply societies also the milk so uh, supply societies uh, which is basically seen as providing uh, the production of milk in large way by the agriculturist was the main motto the milk supply society is not only collect the milk uh, mild available milk available in the villages and supply to the consumer uh, in the towns but uh, they also provide agriculturist with fund to purchase more uh, milk cow animals feeds and their nourishment uh, for the so superior cattle uh, these activities were related to uh, the production of uh, the milk and then we have the sugar cooperatives also so the sugar cooperatives are essentially the processing cooperatives the sugar cooperatives are formed in the regions where sugar cone uh, cane is grown in abundance generally the cane growers in the given area for instance uh, a cluster of 100 villages from a cooperatives uh, they came together and we try to see that uh, crop loans can be provided to them uh, and also we have the uh, sort of uh, supports in terms of lifting the irrigation uh, facilities uh, providing some other alternatives in terms of hybrid seeds chemical fertilizers so these are the provisions which has been there uh, in terms of uh, uh, providing certain support to the uh, sugar industries uh, and also uh, in terms of harvest and transport of the cane uh, through the contract teams uh, so these are certain initiatives which had been planned to make uh, uh, the sugar cooperatives more effective now as i said that uh, uh, how uh, we have seen 
the success of the uh, different cooperatives at the various level. So, one successful case uh, which we can refer here uh, for your detailed understanding is uh, what we call it as the operation flood, uh, which is uh, one of an important case study in terms of its success. So, operation flood uh, which was rightly been considered as the world biggest dairy development program in terms of its coverage and longevity. It covers around 10 million rural milk producing households all over India and uh, it has been launched on 1st July 1970. It is still uh, uh, ongoing and it is credited with uh, you can say the idea of the white revolution in India by creating a flood of rural uh, rural uh, rurally producing milk and enabling the India to achieve the self sufficiency in milk and the milk product. So, I think uh, the idea of operation flood was basically uh, carried forward and it has become the world highest milk producing country by the year 1988-89. Uh, the program has generated uh, a tremendous support from the central government. Uh, let us try to see how the genesis of the operation flood took place. So, the operation flood uh, owes its origin to the late Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri uh, who was basically interested in the Kera that is the Kheda District Cooperative Milk Producers Union Limited pop popularly we try to call it as Amul that is Anand Milk Union Limited. And uh, they invited Prime Minister Shastri to inaugurate its uh, modern uh, computerized cattle feed plant at Kanjari uh, which is a village situated 8 kilometers away from Anand and Prime Minister commissioned the plant on 31st October 1964. Vargase Kurin uh, was the general manager of Amul and he selected uh, Ajarpur village for this purpose and the village has a milk producers cooperative having 411 members. The Prime Minister was so convinced about uh, the Amul model of uh, uh, dairy development that he asked Kurin to prepare a program and later on he cherished the operation flood and sent it to Prime Minister. And on 2nd December 1964, the Prime Minister sent a demi official letter to all the cabinet minister and to the chief ministers and the governors of all the state commending the program to all of them for implementation. So, the Prime Minister also approved the establishment of an organization uh, that is the National Dairy Development Board NDDB, which the mandate was to replicate the Amul model all over India. So, the NDDB was officially registered on 27 September 1965 as an autonomous government society under the administrative control of Union Minister of Agriculture and Prime Minister Shastri uh, was most valuable uh, has most valuable legacy to India was to provide NDDB and the operation flood and that is how we try to see that cooperative movement has taken its shapes uh, in the true color. And, uh, uh, Kurin was been insisting upon and uh, he was uh, having uh, NDDB uh, having its uh, headquarter at Anand and Prime Minister has appointed Kurin as the honorary chairman of uh, uh, this NDDB board, a position which he held from 1965 uh, till 1998. So, we try to see that uh, uh, these are certain initiatives uh, which has been done and uh, the main objective of uh, the various aspect of this uh, uh, operation flood was to make available the wholesome milk at stable and reasonable prices to the bulk of city consumer. Uh, second was to enable the dairy organization involved in the project to identify and satisfy the need of consumer and the producer. Uh, third is uh, to improve the productivity of uh, dairy farming in the rural areas with the long term objective of achieving the self sufficiency in milk. And then to remove the dairy cattle from the cities uh, and also we try to see the final thing that is to establish a broad basis for the accelerated development of the national dairy industry in the project period. So, these are certain uh, initiatives which have been done and uh, I think uh, as we say that uh, the Amul model of the dairy development uh, was seen as the landmark. So, operation flood uh, sought to replicate the Amul model of dairy development all over India. The Amul model is based on the Anand pattern cooperative structure which seems to be the most appropriate form of people's organization for rural development. So, the Anand pattern dairy cooperative formulate and, and implement their own policies and programs for the dairy development in the various areas 
uh, they used to hire the professional managers and technicians uh, for this purpose. Uh, the role of the government is limited to assisting the cooperatives uh, financially and also in implementing their own programs. So, I think uh, we try to see that uh, the effort of cooperatives uh, are not to be seen as the individualistic level. Uh, they are basically uh, to be seen in tune with the uh, central and the state government uh, and I think uh, cooperative is uh, uh, one such initiative which is going to make uh, uh, number of uh, entrepreneurship uh, within the country especially we try to speak about the rural India. I think uh, the need of the hour is to make them self-reliant uh, which of course is been promised for India to make at Nirbar. So, that way I think uh, the cooperative uh, movement and the various cooperative initiatives uh, which has taken place historically they have to be revived uh, in a new way to make them more effective. So, I think uh, this is how we try to see uh, the notion of economic democracy which can be reached through the cooperative movements and I think uh, the glaring example are seen through uh, the various uh, projects of uh, successful cooperatives uh, running in India especially we can speak about uh, uh, the Amul in that sense as such or we can speak about various sugar cooperatives which are functioning very effectively uh, to make the economic democracy and to make the rural uh, society more entrepreneur in terms of self-sufficiency. Uh, so, I think uh, uh, friends uh, uh, this was the aspect uh, which was uh, one uh, component uh, which we have to deal with and now let us try to quickly move down to another important component uh, that is the Panchayati Raj institution. I think uh, that is going to be the second uh, aspect of discussion uh, basically when we try to speak about uh, a certain amount of uh, changes in the rural societies in terms of uh, uh, rural development. I think uh, both these aspects are going to be quite significant. So, I think uh, Panchayati Raj, I think uh, if you try to speak about that, it is uh, as I said earlier that it is a form of democratic decentralization. The term Panchayati Raj in India signifies the system of rural, uh, rural local self-government. It, it ensures the direct participation of people at the grassroots level. It is created in all the states in India by the act of concerned state legislature to establish the democracy at the grassroots level. It is entrusted with the duties and the responsibility in the field of rural development. It was constitutionalized through the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1992. At the central level, the Ministry of Rural Development looks after the matter relating to the Panchayati Raj bodies and it falls within the greater traditions of our country. So, we talk about the issue of Panch Parmeshwar uh, historically which means that uh, the God speaks through the Panch and that is the basic idea uh, which has mooted the idea of Panchayati Raj institutions. And we now understand about the Gram Panchayats, uh, the traditional Gram Panchayats are been replaced by uh, the modern <coughs> uh, Gram Panchayats uh, which are seen in the elect, uh, electoral forms. Uh, so, the role of Panchayati Raj has to be analyzed with reference to the great Indian traditions and Gandhiji was uh, highly convinced that Gram Panchayat should uh, be made all powerful so that uh, uh, it could take all the decision pertaining to administration and development and so Gandhiji often has talked about uh, uh, the whole notion of Gram Swaraj uh, which literally means the autonomy of the village and I think uh, the village as a collectively has to be seen in terms of uh, the rule uh, uh, over itself and that is the basic motto behind the Panchayati Raj institution. So, let us try to see the historical backdrop under which the Panchayati Raj institution has came into prominence. So, the concept of Panchayati Raj uh, is relatively new. Uh, earlier it was termed as village panchayat or the district board and it was used for the rural self-government. <coughs> Actually, the village panchayats were meant for the rural administration and particularly administration in the fields of social services and rural reconstructions. And the village panchayat is a link between the people and the bureaucracy at the state level. So, in our country the system of panchayat, village panchayat uh, is very old and, <coughs> and we try to see that village panchayat has been seen in ancient and the medieval period. Uh, but when we try to speak about uh, during the British period we have uh, revived the panchayati raj and when popular ministries were formed under the government. India Act of 1919, uh, various provinces passed the Village Panchayat Act of 1919. So, the Gram Panchayat which worked during the British period largely consisted of the higher caste of the villages and the poorer caste and the lower caste has no representation in these bodies and the powers 
uh, which were given to the gram panchayats were very few in number. But now we try to see that uh, we have the uh, reforms with regard to the panchayat system, uh, village panchayats and now we try to speak about the constitutional obligations. So, the constitution of Panchayat Raj is now it is basically seen as an effective measures whereby the directive principles of the state policy lays down the state shall take steps to organize village panchayats and to enable them to function as a units of self-government. So, the objective of the constitution of Panchayati Raj was are twofold. First is the decentralization of power and second is the development of the villages. Yet another reason for the creation of Panchayati Raj was uh, to seek the cooperation and participation of masses of people in the national reconstruction and development. Uh, I think uh, initially in 1952 the Panchayati Raj bodies were entrusted with the implementation of uh, uh, the first uh, uh, independent uh, rural development program that is the community development project CDP and the institution of Shramdan voluntary labor was created to involve the people in the development of their own village. So, the Panchayati Raj uh, uh, did not make any headway in the development of the village. The CDPs were considered as a project of development from above and that is through the government. So, it was essential for development that the initiative should have come from the below. So, virtually we try to see that the masses of the people should have uh, uh, the greater control in terms of their own decisions and to overcome these difficulties a committee was headed uh, under the chairmanship of Balwant Raj, uh, Balwant Rai Mehta uh, who was uh, uh, initially uh, taking into consideration the experiment in Andhra Pradesh and Rajasthan. So, the Mehta committee has watershed in the development of Panchayati Raj. Now, let us try to see the Balwant Rai Mehta committee uh, which was basically uh, which started <coughs> uh, uh, in terms of reforms in the Panchayati Raj. So, if you try to see the uh, trajectory, we try to find out that in January 1957, the government of India has appointed a committee to examine the functioning of the community development program in 1952 and the national executive services in 1953 and also to suggest the measures for their better performance. So, the, the committee submitted its report in November 1957 and recommended the establishment of the scheme for democratic decentralization which ultimately came to be known as the Panchayati Raj. So, the Balwant Rai Mehta committee found that the CDP when came at the Gram Panchayat level were considered to be the program of the government and not the program of the village people. So, the village self sufficiency could not be attained without the active participation of the village people. So, the Mehta committee therefore suggested that the villagers should be given power to decide about their own felt need and implement the program accordingly. And the specific recommendations which has been made by the Balwant Rai Mehta committee were uh, first is the establishment of the three tier Panchayati Raj system which includes Zilla Parishad at the district level, Panchayat Samiti at the block level and Gram Panchayat at the village level. Second thing is that these tiers should be organically linked together through the device of indirect election. The third is the village panchayat should be constituted with directly elected representative whereas the panchayat samiti and zilla parishad should be constituted with the indirectly elected members. And next is that all the planning and the development activities should be entrusted to these bodies. And the panchayat samiti should be executed body while the zilla parishad should be advisory and coordinating and supervisory body. So, I think that is the essence of uh, the grassroots democracy. Uh, the district collector should be the chairman of the Zilla Parishad. There should be a genuine transfer of power and responsibility uh, to these democratic bodies and uh, uh, a system should be evolved to affect further devolution of authority uh, in future. Uh, th these are the important aspects and then the recommendations of uh, the Balwant Rai Mehta committee were been expect, uh, accepted by the National Development Council in January 1958 and the council did not insist upon the single rigid pattern and left it to the state to evolve their own pattern suitable to the local conditions. Like Rajasthan was the first state to establish the institution of Panchayati Raj and the scheme was inaugurated by the Prime Minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru on October 2nd 1959 in Nagaur district in Rajasthan. Uh, so, Rajasthan was followed by Andhra Pradesh uh, which has adopted the 
थ्री टीयर पंचायती राज सिस्टम इन नाइनटीन एंड राजस्थान ऑल्सो हैज अडोप्टेड द थ्री टीयर सिस्टम समवेयर वी आर ट्राई टू सी सर्टन एक्सेप्शन हैव बिन देयर लाइक तमिलनाडु हैज अडोप्टेड द टू टीयर सिस्टम वेस्ट बंगाल हैज अडोप्टेड द फोर टीयर सिस्टम सो पंचायती राज विच केम इन टू एग्जिस्टेंस फॉलोइंग द रिकमेंडेशन ऑफ मेहता कमेटी हैज द थ्री मेजर ऑब्जेक्टिव फर्स्ट इज टू रिप्रेजेंट द फेल्ट नीड ऑफ द विलेज कम्युनिटी दैट इज द फर्स्ट सेकेंड इज टू गिव पावर टू द नॉन ऑफिशियल्स फॉर द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द विलेज कम्युनिटीज एंड द थर्ड इज टू गिव पावर ऑफ इम्प्लीमेंटेशन और एग्जीक्यूशन ऑफ प्रोग्राम्स टू द पीपल सो आई थिंक दीज आर द थ्री ब्रॉडर रिकमेंडेशन विच हैज बीन मेड बाय द बलवंत राय मेहता कमेटी टू मेक द अफेक्टिव यूज ऑफ द डेमोक्रेटिक डिसेंट्राइजेशन बट एज वी ऑल नो दैट द कमिटी हैज देयर ओन रिकमेंडेशंस एंड एज वी सेड दैट ऑल स्टेट डिड नॉट एक्सेप्ट इट सो आई थिंक फर्दर अटेम्प्ट हैज बीन मेड टू मेक सर्टन रिफॉर्म्स एंड द थ्री टीयर पैटर्न ऑफ पंचायती राज एज वॉज रिकमेंडेड अर्लियर दैट कुड नॉट बी सक्सेसफुल इन मेनी अदर स्टेट्स and the new pattern of uh, recommendation was been insisted uh, under the chairmanship of ashok mehta committee so now let us see the second uh, recommendations uh, with regard to the democratic decentralization of uh, through the panchayati raj system so that has been implemented uh, uh, under the chairmanship of ashok mehta committee so in december 1977 the janata government has appointed a committee on panchayati raj institutions under the chairmanship of ashok mehta and ashok mehta was an economist uh, and he was uh, heading the committee of panchayati raj uh, 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 <coughs> keeping in view the balwant rai mehta committee recommendations so in 1977 the ashok mehta committee has recommended the fundamental change in the panchayati raj system it asked for the transformation of panchayat from an implementing agency uh, to the political institution and in order to implement the recommendations the need for the constitutional amendment was also required so uh he has given a uh, basic understanding to the direction in the form of 64th constitution amendment bill which was uh, defected in rajya sabha so in 1992 another legislation that is the 73rd amendment bill was introduced in parliament which which was adopted in the same year and what were the major recommendations of uh, this uh, uh, with regard to the uh, ashokra mehta committee we try to see that uh, first thing is the three tier system of the panchayat raj should be replaced by the two tier system that was the first important recommendation of uh, the ashok mehta committee that is the zila parishad at the district level and below it the mandal panchayat consisting of group of villages comprising of population of 15000 to 20000 second is a district should be first point for decentralization uh, that is going to be an important issue and the zila parishad should be the executive body and be made responsible for planning at the district level then we also see that the panchayati raj institution should have a compulsory power for taxation to mobilize their own financial resources or uh, to giving them the financial uh, 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 autonomy also that was another important provision which has been made by ashok mehta uh, there should be a regular social audit uh, by the district uh, agency and by the committee of the legislators to check whether the fund allotted for the vulnerable sections of the society is effectively utilized or not and the state government should not supersede the panchayati raj institution so i think uh, this is where we try to see the high level of uh, uh, autonomy uh, was been planned and devised in the uh, uh, name of panchayati raj institution and ashok mehta wanted to make it uh, more viable and effective especially the naya panch naya panchayats uh, should be kept as a separate body from that of the developmental panchayats and i think uh, this is basically that they should be presided over by a qualified judge i think that speaks about uh, uh, the gravity in which uh, the reforms were uh, to be supported even the chief election commissioner uh, election, uh, electoral officer of the state in consultation with the chief election commissioner uh, should organize and conduct the panchayati raj elections so i think uh, these are significant measures uh, which has been uh, done and we try to see that uh, the various voluntary agencies uh, should play an important role in mobilizing the support of the people for the panchayati raj even the seats for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes should be reserved on the basis of their population i think uh, these are certain landmark things uh, uh, which we can think about and we try to see that uh, the recommendation of the ashok mehta committee 
uh, they were initially being launched uh, basically in the state of Karnataka, West Bengal and Andhra Pradesh uh, who tried to uh, put them effectively. And uh, later on I think uh, uh, just like Balwant Raj Mehta committee uh, uh, followed by Ashok Mehta committee, another important committee uh, quickly we can just share uh, has been implemented that is the GVK Rao committee. So, the GVK Rao committee uh, on the administrative arrangement of the rural development and poverty elevation program under the chairmanship of uh, uh, Rao uh, was appointed by the planning commission in 1985. And the committee came into conclusion that the development process was been gradually bureaucratized and the diverse from the Panchayati Raj. So, I think that was an effective uh, uh, recommendation which was been made by uh, this committee and quickly we can have another committee which was also significant with regard to the Panchayati Raj institution that is the Ellen L. M. Singhvi committee. So, in 1986 uh, Rajiv Gandhi government appointed a committee on revitalization of the Panchayati Raj institution for the democracy and development. And uh, a committee was formed under the L.M. Singhvi uh, and uh, the major recommendations uh, which has been suggested by uh, Singhvi committee was that Nyaya Panchayat should be established for a cluster of villages. That was first important recommendation. Then we have the village panchayat should have more financial resources. I think uh, that was with regard to the what you can say economic uh, uh, mobilization. And then uh, the third thing is the judicial tribunals should be established in each state uh, to eradicate the controversies uh, about elections in the Panchayati Raj institutions uh, and their dissolution. Uh, so, I think uh, this is how uh, the various committees have been formulated uh, to make uh, uh, the reforms in phases. Uh, I think uh, all the committees have their own merits and demerits. Uh, but the more important thing of course is that how uh, the Panchayati Raj institutions have to be uh, seen effective in terms of spread and also in terms of practices uh, that is going to be an important issue. And I think uh, most significant thing uh, which we normally try to highlight with regard to the Panchayati Raj institution is the 73rd constitutional amendment. I think uh, that is uh, uh, one of the biggest achievement uh, that we could made out of the various uh, amendment that we had and we try to see that the 73rd amendment is going to be uh, one of the important uh, uh, what I can say landmark with regard to the Panchayati Raj institution. So, we try to see that uh, Panchayati Raj institution uh, under the <coughs> leadership of uh, various committees uh, all of them has uh, uh, to some extent asked for or demanded for elections to the Panchayat bodies uh, to be held on the individual basis and the candidates who were contesting for the elections were not nominated by the political parties uh, that is going to be an important issue. So, the 73rd constitutional amendment allows political parties to enter into the election fray and in other words the elections to Panchayati Raj were to be contested on the party basis. So, I think uh, this is how we try to see a significant shift which took place, but what is more important uh, with regard to the 73rd amendment is that uh, the Panchayati Raj is uh, to empower the women and the weaker sections including the uh, women uh, in a representative manner in terms of a fixed quota uh, by the constitution. I think that is uh, going to be the important uh, aspect uh, uh, in order to empower the women scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. And we try to see that some of the important features of uh, the 73rd amendment act were uh, first is that the panchayat will be considered political institutions uh, in a truly decentralized structure. I think that was first important thing that we have to keep in mind. Uh, second is the Gram Sabha uh, shall be recognized as the lifeline of the Panchayati Raj. Uh, the voters of the village of the clusters of the village will constitute its membership. Third is there will be a direct election in all the three tier of the governance that is at the Gram Panchayat, Panchayat Samiti and the Zilla Parishad at all the levels here should be the direct elections. And then we have the issue of empowerment of the women uh, that is basically seen through the one third of uh, reservations of the total seats at all levels uh, for the women and one third uh, seats shall be remained for scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. That was one of the salient feature of the 73rd amendment act and uh, each Panchayati Raj institution uh, will have a tenure of 5 years and in any case it is to be dissolved by the state government the fresh elections 
uh, will be held within a period of six months. So, I think uh, this is another landmark thing to make it uh, more institutional. Uh, there should be a specific framework within which the things are to be materialized. There will be a separate election commission and also a financial commission for the Panchayati Raj institutions in every state. And also, uh, it has been said that uh, it is obligatory on the part of the center as well as on the state to provide adequate funds for the PRI to enable them to function properly. So, I think uh, these are certain important things uh, uh, which are being taken into consideration through the 73rd amendment act and which was uh, going to be very much instrumental in making the panchayati institution to be more effective. Now, I think uh, uh, since we have understood uh, the various uh, 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 amendments, uh, the various committees which had been formulated for the implementation of the Panchayati Raj. Now, let us try to understand that uh, what are the functions of Panchayati Raj uh, in order to make or in order to understand that what are the limits uh, or what are the scope of Panchayati Raj uh, in terms of its uh, implementation. So, we try to see that the structure of Panchayati Raj was designed in such a way that 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act gives certain powers and functions to the three tier structure of Panchayati Raj. And we try to see that uh, uh, the act enables the elected representative to take their own decisions uh, within the framework of the act. And uh, some of the important functions of the Panchayati Raj uh, which we can see are uh, based on uh, the following issues. First of course is the agriculture development and the irrigation facilities. I think that was one important thing uh, that has to be taken care by Panchayati Raj. Second is the land reforms, third is the eradication of poverty uh, that is another important thing. We have the dairy farming and the poultry farming, fish rearing and other uh, allied activities which are part and parcel of uh, the Panchayati Raj institutions in terms of its functioning. Uh, the issue of rural housing, safe drinking water, social forestry primary education, uh, roads and buildings, markets and fairs and even the child and the women development that is also uh, under the purview of the function of the Panchayati Raj institutions and ultimately the welfare for the weaker section scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes that was ultimate. And apart from that I think some special provisions which have been made by the Panchayati Raj institution was the enforcement of the prohibition, protection of the land, uh, minor forest produce. Uh, water resources, village market and the overall development, these are the essence of uh, the uh, uh, functions of Panchayati Raj. I think uh, if you try to see in a very broader sense, I think uh, most of the things are covered uh, when we try to speak about the Panchayati Raj institution in terms of its functioning and uh, that way if you try to see that the effective measures if they are taken, so uh, we can have all possibility of the holistic development of uh, uh, the rural society. But uh, more important uh, as we shared that 73rd amendment which was trying to give uh, the representation of uh, one third uh, uh, in the <coughs> elections uh, for the women and the weaker section, I think that is going to be very uh, significant and we try to see that uh, the 50 percent reservation of the seats uh, which was uh, been devised basically for uh, having the reservations for the women in the local self government. Uh, and we try to see that uh, it has been noticed by the government of India uh, uh, to have certain amount of amendment with regard to the article 243D of the constitution to raise the level of reservation for women including the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe women in panchayat from the present one third to at least half of the seats uh, and offices of the chairpersons in panchayats uh, during the parliamentary section uh, sessions. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, uh, which are there uh, like we try to see that uh, Bihar was seen as first stage to offer 50 percent reservations for women in panchayat in 2005 and uh, later on it was implemented in 2006. Uh, it was been followed by uh, states like Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and has also announced uh, 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 who had also announced the 50 percent reservations of seat. We also try to see that Kerala who has implemented 50 percent reservation of women uh, in the panchayat. So, I think uh, attempts have been made to go beyond uh, one third and I think uh, more representation of uh, women and the uh, weaker sections of the society uh, has been uh, devised in many of the states uh, to make uh, uh, what I can say the true representation of women and the uh, neglected sections of the society into the mainstream. 
So, I think uh, this is where we have to really see uh, that to what extent we can have certain amount of uh, reforms with regard to the prevailing practices uh, with regard to the panchayatara institutions. I think, uh, but the broader question that we have to keep in mind of course, is that why uh, do the women require empowerment? Uh, somewhere I think uh, they have to have their own capability uh, to make themselves so efficient to fight uh, along with the male. But again, the point is that uh, historically speaking, uh, the sort of neglect which has been given for the women, how they are going to overcome them, uh, that is going to be a crucial issue. And that is why I think uh, uh, the need of the hour of course, is to give them uh, the constitutional representation uh, to make them more effective. But I think uh, if you try to see, uh, uh, still we have many uh, gaps uh, which can be seen as a critique of the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act. Uh, to be uh, more focused uh, if you try to speak about. We can say that uh, uh, there are many uh, provisions uh, which should have been effectively done, but because of many reasons and drawbacks, we do not find that uh, these things are going to be more effective. And broadly, if you try to see that how we can have a certain amount of uh, disjunct which has been uh, seen with regard to the panchayatera institutions are, the first important thing is that bias towards the elites and the middle class that of course, is the typicality which we try to see that uh, the so called uh, elites and the middle class have uh, uh, the upper hand with regard to the decision making. Uh, second concern is as we all know is the concern for illiteracy. I think that plays a critical role uh, in terms of making it more effective. Uh, we also try to see that non availability of the women uh, who are actually uh, coming forward for taking the leadership. Uh, that is another important concern and sometimes we try to see that in spite of uh, <coughs> the women uh, who are being nominated, I think uh, uh, the male member, their husband or their father sometimes are seen as uh, the proxy representative of the panchayas. And sometimes we try to call them as what you can say, uh, not calling them as uh, the Pradhan in the real sense, rather we try to say uh, Pradhan uh, Patni who are going to be uh, governed by the Pradhan uh, through their husband or father. So, I think uh, these are the criticalities which we try to see and ultimately the concern lies with the corrupt leadership and the bureaucracy, uh, which I think is the ultimate, uh, uh, which is a universal phenomenon. But more than that, what is required of course, is that uh, uh, the corrupt leadership and the bureaucracy, if uh, these things are at the grassroots, then definitely I think uh, the higher uh, side of our nation uh, or the upper apex bodies are also going to have uh, the same phenomenon. So, I think it has to be eradicated uh, at its pace uh, at the earliest. And that is how we try to see that uh, uh, the things have to be drastically worked out. So, uh, friends, I think uh, these are certain things uh, uh, we try to spoke at length about uh, the cooperatives, uh, the cooperative movements in India, uh, which were basically seen as an important tool for the rural development in terms of uh, the <coughs> so called economic democracy. And now we are trying to, we have seen in the second, sec, uh, second section about the panchayatira institutions, which are seen as a formula for democratic decentralization uh, to make uh, the political democracy in the uh, rural countryside. And that is how we try to see that uh, uh, many such attempts has been made. But the basic idea of course, is how we are going to make uh, the uh, grassroots uh, in a more effective way that is going to be an important issue. I think uh, uh, for having further readings, uh, plenty of materials are there. I think uh, many government sites are there which you can refer. And I think uh, for Panchetiraj, you have the se separate ministry uh, which is working for that and you have uh, the <coughs> websites uh, where you can have all the updates uh, which is state specific also and also it is at the centralized level. And uh, we can also see the status of cooperatives, uh, but again uh, uh, to have further readings in the academic sense, uh, we can have the readings from ARDSI work that is rural sociology in India. And apart from that, we have Kartar Singh's uh, work. Uh, from SAGE publication that is rural development uh, that is again going to be important. But beyond that, I think multiple studies are there uh, which are working for uh, uh, the understanding of cooperatives and panchetiraj. So, I think uh, these are certain things which I wanted to uh, discuss with you uh, to make the things more effective and viable. I think uh, uh, with these understandings, uh, you can have a better uh, way of knowing about the uh, countryside, <coughs> especially when we try to speak about uh, the rural society. I think these are the initiatives which can be seen as the landmark for bringing about a transformation in the rural society. So, thank you friends for patient listening.